Hello everyone, Danny Rowdy of DannyRowdy.com. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Thank you for commenting, subscribing, etc. <laughs> I sincerely appreciate it. I have an amazing viewership, so thank you guys very much for making that possible. Today I wanted to talk about six things I wish I knew before integrating Ray Pete's dietary ideas into my own life. And so I think I first heard about Ray Pete in the end of 2010, like beginning of 2011. And I think 2011 was mostly an in-between year. I was I was still stuck on the carnivore zero carb way of seeing things, and I was I thought pemmican was like an antibiotic, and I, I was still convinced that something really terrible was going on in my intestine. And so uh, I think I really started to shifting over to Ray Pete's dietary ideas in in 2012. And there were lots of things that I did for a really long time that I think uh, were harmful to me, to myself. And so I was inducing the harm. And so if I could go back and, and do things over or tell people other my experience and, and share that with other people interested in Ray Pete's ideas, th these are the things I would say. So the first thing, and I would recommend doing this, even if you didn't think Ray Pete was onto anything, uh, would be to... Uh, try to collect data about yourself. That's important. Not only the symptoms that you're trying to overcome, uh, maybe keeping a diary of how you feel and including your your uh, resting pulse rate and underarm temperature when you uh, upon rising and then again in the afternoon and maybe averaging those together to get a sense of where your metabolic rate is. And this is the Broda Barnes uh, basal metabolic uh, rate test. And it's, I think it's really more accurate than most blood tests. So I think uh, getting familiar with that and, and seeing where you're at is important. And then also uh, when you feel really bad measuring your pulse and temperature, and then when you feel really good measuring your pulse and temperature and seeing what the difference is. And in addition to that, if a person was motivated, I think they could get blood tests for TSH, total cholesterol, prolactin, parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, and serum phosphate. And those would, again, clarify the situation even more. And you could take the pulse and temperature, your diary, kind of how you're feeling, and also the blood tests and put them into a application. Like I, I use Evernote, but there's a new one called Notion and just uh, accumulating lots of information so you can disconnect from the internet view of health. And so you never have to listen to a person like myself or, uh, or any forum or any self-proclaimed guru or anything. And you would have empirical information about yourself that you could constructively find the best information available, marry the information about yourself with the best information available and kind of proceed from there. And so that would be the number one thing that I would uh, re uh, recommend or the first thing rather. And the second one, uh, uh, I actually wish I had warmed up to the idea of using antibiotics sooner. I know this is controversial, but I think after zero carb, a vegan, vegetarian, like years of dieting, I had, I must have developed some kind of bacterial overgrowth in my intestine. And I thought I was just the, one of the reasons I did the zero carb diet is I was just convinced that I was uh, highly reactive to every type of food. But I think in retrospect, I just had a bacterial infection and that's why I was reacting so bizarrely to normal foods. And so, uh, I, one of Ray's, uh, uh, foods that he talks about is milk and I really like milk and I couldn't drink it. So I would drink a cup and just have to run to the bathroom 45 minutes later and living with people, this is not a fun experience. And this went on for way too long. And I was listening to Ray Pete on like a, some interview. And he, he said that he thought milk mal maldigestion was mostly chronic inflammation in the intestine. And I knew that bacteria or endotoxin could be a chronic source of, of intestinal inflammation. And so once I, I was pretty desperate at this point, And also I had tried so many different things that I was really willing to, to think outside my, my mental cage box that I had created. And I, of course, had heard that antibiotics are the worst things you could possibly use. They destroy your microbiome <laughs> and things like that. And again, I'm not advocating for, uh, uh, every different type of antibiotic available. The, there are, I think there are safer versions and unsafe versions. So penicillin VK, erythromycin or clarithromycin, uh, those are called macrolides. And then the tetracyclines, the minocycline or doxycycline. And, and, and again, there's side effects to these types of things. So you have to be, I think your diet has to be good and you probably have to use vitamin K. Uh, but I wish I had done that sooner because after two weeks of using penicillin VK, I could comfortably digest milk. And so that was, that was a pretty big revelation to me. And it was such a pain point that I was so happy to see that I had resolved it. 
And again, you know, a person wouldn't have to jump straight into the pharmaceutical antibiotics. They could use the carrot salad and the mushrooms, which are food antibiotics or the bamboo shoots. And then if a person really didn't want to mess around with antibiotics, they could use uh, the bacillus strains, the clausi, lichenoformis, and subtilis, which are available in like Russia as a product called Biosporin, and then a, a product in the U.S. over-the-counter called Megasporbiotic. And again, those might be worth trying if a person just had chronic digestive problems, no matter what they were eating. Uh, so like gas or diarrhea or constipation or whatever. So this might sound trivial, but the third thing is to, or at least for me that I learned over time, that the the sour and tart orange juice really affected, uh, I, I think, my the intestinal inflammation over a long period of time. And so I, when I was in San Francisco, when I, I would buy fancy $12 uh, uh, half gallon of orange juice, but it was always tart or sour because it'd be sitting there for, for quite a while. And I didn't uh, love the taste of the orange juice, but I didn't really know any better. And I think one time I went and I bought a hand pressed juicer and I got some Valencia oranges uh, in San Francisco that were only available for a few months. And I pressed them and drank the orange juice and uh, it like greatly alleviated my intestinal inflammation, kind of bloating. And also it tasted so much better than any store-bought orange juice I had ever had. It was neutral in acidity and also it was sweet, more like candy. And I was like, man, I don't think I'd ever even tasted what good orange juice uh, tasted like. And so for me, uh, at this point in my life, if I get sour oranges here in Mexico, I'll actually just throw them out. And I, I hate wasting food. I, I can make marmalade with them as well. Uh, but I, it upsets my stomach so much that uh, then again, I'd only prefer uh, like sweet orange juice or sweet fruits and things like that, which brings us to another big problem. Uh, finding good food is difficult. You know, the food supply is so bad. So this can be challenging. Uh, and, and it is a new challenge every time I go visit another location. Uh, and sometimes canned fruits are good, like longans or lychees and other canned fruits. Those can be really ripe and, and tasty when you get them straight out of the can. Uh, but just something if a person has sensitive digestion, thinking about and they want to drink orange juice. I like it. it it's uh, I think it's a good source of carbohydrate. It contains anti-inflammatory chemicals like noringin and noringin and has like anti-endotoxin properties. So I think it's uh, interesting food. Uh, but again, it can be perilous with the food supply as it is right now. So another thing uh, similar to the orange juice is being really judicious with supplements. Uh, so again, I think I contributed to lots of my own issues by taking oral supplements. And, uh, I knew that Ray used a lot of the supplements on his skin, but I was like, oh, that's too annoying. I'm, I'm never going to do that. And, uh, I think at just one point I, I did try that and some mysterious digestive problems just immediately went away. And so, uh, I think usually the less supplements, the better, but I do take thyroid and aspirin orally, occasionally antibiotics and things like that, but I'll use vitamins D and K on my skin and any hormone and things like that on my skin. And those, uh, albeit is, it is more expensive. It's not very economical. Like, uh, I think you absorb way less when you're using on the skin, but for me, it's kind of just a necessity at this point because I don't want to have <laughs> bad digestion. Uh, so, so again, I think, uh, again, a thyroid supplement can be really useful, you know, like, and some brands are, are pretty safe, but, uh, but I think, the, getting the thyroid and, and a good diet and things like aspirin can be difficult and take a lot of experimentation in and of themselves. And so the more uh, supplements you add into the mix, I think that not only increases the complexity of whatever health issue a person is trying to overcome, but it's also perilous in that every supplement is a possible allergen. And since the intestine is so central to the stress systems and the energy systems and, th and things like that, it would be uh, just risky to throw a bunch of supplements into the mix. And so again, uh, the, the fifth thing, which is similar to the supplements idea is, uh, I'm open to being wrong on this, but I, I think oysters and liver, uh, I think uh, it would be good for a person to work them into their regular nutrition in some way, shape or form. And I don't think there are replacements for these foods. 
Uh, and like I just talked about, I think I've talked to people that have said like, oh, I can't, I, I hate the taste of liver, you know, so I'm going to take a vitamin A supplement, a zinc supplement, a copper supplement, a selenium supplement. And I just, it's not the same thing. And also it's dangerous, I think. So, and also the desiccated thyroid, like if you look up the nutritional profile on the desiccated uh, liver supplement, they, they don't even resemble fresh liver, you know, they're, uh, so I don't think that's a replacement for them e- either. For liver, you can make a pate, and uh, some people I knew that would never touch liver enjoyed a pate. And then with oysters, you can make a soup with them, you know. And uh, I, again, people that would never eat oysters, I, I've had them eat a soup, and it was fine. So you you kind of have to get creative <laughs> with some of these things, but I think it is possible. Uh, and again, I just when we're talking about uh, increasing the metabolic rate, which is all the information on this channel is is focused on that prospect. I think you're going to quickly need more nutrition, and I don't know how to obtain that nutrition uh, in a quicker, easier way than with oysters, uh, liver, eggs, and things like that. So I, th- I think th- of those foods as like supplemental foods uh, to help uh, nourish the person when they're increasing their metabolic rate and these various stress-related nutri- uh, nutritional deficiencies and things. So finally, uh, I am always amazed when somebody tells me they don't know how to cook. I, I'm very fortunate because I learned to cook at like 14 or 15, just messing around in the kitchen. Uh, but with YouTube nowadays, I think it's even easier to figure out how to cook some dish that you've never made before, like oxtail or something. And I think this is really uh, non-negotiable. I think if you want to take care of yourself, I think l- learning how to cook your own food is just... I don't know what could be more important than that because I've talked to some people and they've told me that they've talked to restaurants nearby and they've had them make their food, you know, and maybe I'm uh, crazy, but I just would never trust like a restaurant to make my own food because I've worked in the restaurant industry and I know it happens kind of uh, behind closed doors. But I think this is very important. And if you if you don't have time to feed yourself, correctly, you know, uh, then I think you might have bigger problems. So I think this is very important and just, uh, kind of getting your hands dirty and figuring out how to like cook ground beef or, uh, uh, cook liver or whatever. I think those are important variables. So that's it. Thank you guys so much. (laughs) Please subscribe. I am doing uh, every other week live streams, uh, with my friends. And so, I think you can, from now on, you can expect a regular stream of content, no pun intended. Uh, And again, you guys are amazing. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and they'll motivate me to do more whenever inspiration inspiration strikes. Uh, And please comment and I'll try to get back to as many of those comments as possible. You guys are amazing. I have an amazing viewership. Uh, Thank you guys so much and I'll talk to you soon.